when doing my previous video for be holy whatever that means I got sidetracked for a period on the man at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5 because I had recently heard someone use that same passage in order to mock the person's victim mentality. The passage describes him as the impotent man who was there for 38 years and I heard a message of someone mocking him basically as having a victim mentality and not basically grabbing the healing that was available for him. And so I want to tie this in to James in chapter 2 where it asks, can faith save him? And this is one of the most egregiously, wrongly characterized passages in the entirety of the Bible because there's so much that's being read into it and defined incorrectly. And then we have this horrendously misplaced chapter versification break in the middle of a sentence in the middle of a thought and then a theology is interpreted into this that this is saying that faith without works can't prevent you from being tortured forever and ever after you're dead when it actually goes on to illustrate exactly what it's talking about. And the can faith save him is the middle of the sentence. The sentence hasn't even completed yet. The thought is still ongoing at that point. So we have this passage of the man at the pool of Bethesda. And he's been there 38 years, and no one's bothered to stop and help him. And he complains. He even overtly says, no one has helped me. When Jesus asks, do you want to be made whole, healed? And this is a good illustration to supplement the illustration that's even provided in the book of James on this topic of saying... People are in need, and you need to do something about it according to your means, according to your capacity to do so. Because I'm a firm believer that you might actually be the one laying there for 38 years waiting for someone to come and help you. So, if that's you this is not the message for you because this message is for those who can stop and lend a hand. And it always rubs both ways because there are those who are in need and there are those who have the capacity to help. And it really does rub up against me in a negative way the extent to which I hear a message that says do for yourself, get up, claim your healing, whatever, however they, it's phrased, when it might be that you're the one in need of actual hands-on assistance. And that's kind of what I want to deal with here, is the fact that that's not people that are just ignorant or unwilling or stupid, or won't do what they need to do, that there's an actual inability there. And it needs to be considered that a person in this state of helplessness might need help, and might actually really be in that state of helplessness.
And it's not something to mock, and it's not something to look down upon, and it's not something to discredit or to place blame and claim that it's their own fault that they're in that situation. So let's take a look at these passages here and put them together with the idea that no one can see God unless it is shown to them by those who are acting as the ambassadors of Christ. So let's even revise that thought process. That those who think there's no evidence for God, let's presume they're correct. That their experience has shown them zero evidence that there's anything worth living for and that anything good exists in this world. Let's presume that their life experience has shown them absolutely, positively zero evidence to believe in a God. Let's stop having this idea that they're resistant or rebellious or willfully ignorant or whatever other mischaracterization. Let's assume that they're accurate in their worldview. Let's assume that people that see no evidence of God have never been shown any evidence of God. And that's not something intellectual. Because as I've said before, people believe in pain. People believe in disease. People believe in suffering. People believe in catastrophe and calamity. People believe in murder. People believe in death. People believe in distrust. But what evidence is there to trust people? What evidence is there to have faith in one another? What evidence is there that goodness is real? What evidence is there that kindness reaches out for no reason whatsoever other than for kindness sake? So let's assume that people that don't believe that there's a God have a very good reason to believe there isn't one. And you're not going to argue your way into changing their mind because all you're going to do is further convince them that the people who claim that there's a God are stupid and ignorant and hateful and divisive and think they're better than other people and that your position is your fault. Maybe the real way to share the gospel is to presume that zero people on this face of this earth have any good reason to believe there's a God. And the only way that they're going to change their mind is if you change their experience. So maybe this person sitting here at Bethesda for 38 years has every reason to say nobody has ever helped me not one person has ever stopped and said is there something I can do for you for 38 years nobody has ever shown me that there's a God sure People have claimed that there's something to be done. People have told me that you can get to that water and be healed, but nobody has ever done anything for me. Not one person has ever done a damn thing for me. And that's the view that we should be taking here. So it says in John chapter 5, now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. And Bethesda means the house of kindness or the house of mercy. So here he is at a pool at the house of mercy, kindness, for 38 years, not being shown the mercy and kindness that's allegedly there. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. 
For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatever whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew he had been now a long time in that case, he said to him, Will you be made whole? The impotent man answered, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. So this is not something to mock his victim mentality of, hey, why don't you get it together and claim the healing that's there for you? This is a person with a legitimate reason that the only thing he's been told is, hey, there's something you can do that's going to get you healed. But nobody's ever done anything for him to get him healed. So for 38 years, not one person could be bothered to help him. And Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. And that's where we took last time that this was the issue of healing on the Sabbath and my assertion that the commandment given was remember the Sabbath and keep it for healing. And here Jesus is being accused of healing on the Sabbath. And he says, none of you keep the law because they all said, don't heal on the Sabbath, but sure, go ahead and kill somebody. We can kill somebody for picking up firewood on the Sabbath, but don't heal anybody. That's wrong. You can perform an act of genital mutilation to keep the law of Moses to perform circumcision, but don't heal anybody if it's Saturday. You got six other days of the week to bother to do that, but not on Saturday. And the commandment actually said, remember the Sabbath and keep it for healing. So he's the only one that was actually keeping what the law said, while the rest of them had invented a perversion of the Sabbath, which was that they made a work out of not doing work. You might want to think about that when it comes to some of the grace messages that make a work out of not doing work. So here we are, we have an illustration of somebody that nobody helped him. And when Jesus stopped and talked to the man and asked him if he wanted to be healed, apparently something happened just by the mere act of compassion of saying, is there something I can do for you? Because for 38 years, nobody had ever said, is there something I can do for you? He had just been told, here's this thing you can do for yourself. And all Jesus had to do was say, is there something I can do for you? Because where was he? He was at Jerusalem, the city of peace by the sheep market, a pool, which is in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, the house of mercy. And it wasn't until salvation showed up and said, is there something I can do for you? That he was able to be healed. Because he couldn't do it for himself. And it wasn't just because he was ignorant or had a victim mentality. It's because nobody proved to him that there was anything worth living for. Nobody proved to him that there was a God. Nobody took their time out to say, maybe you can't do it yourself. So now let's go to James chapter 2. Here we go. And this is just horrendously misused and so much is defined incorrectly. So first of all, can faith save him? You know what? Let's just let's read this the way it gets presented and perverted by religion. Let's just read all the insertions into the text, into the text, and subtractions. 
because, I mean, basically verses 15 and 16 just get plucked right out like they're not even there. So religion gives you... Can confession to a religious creed and doctrine save you from suffering eternal conscious torment after you die? Confession of a creed, if it doesn't have religious works according to our denomination, causes eternal conscious torment after you die. So we just jumped from a portion of verse 14 to a misreading of verse 17. Or I should say a misreading of verse 14 to a misreading of verse 17. Skipping 15 and 16, which is the illustration that tells you what faith and save actually mean. Because it's got nothing to do with being prevented from having to suffer whatever kind of depraved torture God intends to inflict on you after you're dead. That's a completely fictional concept of what salvation is to begin with. Can faith save him who? Well, this chapter or verse break is just utterly egregious. So let's notice here that what does it profit? Sandwiches and bookmarks the end, the beginning of verse 14 and the end of verse 16. Because that's what's punctuating the thought here. And everything in between is asking, what does it profit? So there's something that either is of benefit or not of benefit. And it says, though a man says he has faith and have not works, can faith save him? So there we go. That's the, that's the way it's presented. As though that's the end of the thought. And the answer is no. Because when we jump to verse 17, it says, Faith that has not works is dead being alone. But there's an illustration in the middle of this that tells you what save is actually talking about. Because the question isn't even, can faith save him? The question is actually kind of awkwardly worded. It would be better present, presented this way. What does it profit, my brothers, though a man says he has faith and have, has not works? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, can faith save him from being destitute and naked? If all you do is say to them, Depart in peace and be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you don't give them those things which are needful. What good is it? So here's what it's really saying. Does your stupid statement of depart in peace and be warmed and filled when you do absolutely zero to provide that person with his or her needs, what good is that? The, let's let's assume that we're dealing with a real illustration of things that actually happen to people and you come across somebody that's going to be dead by morning because they're freezing and starving to death and you walk past that person and say be warmed and filled god bless you that person's go still going to be dead by morning I mean, can we, can we put this illustration into the realm of reality and not some deranged fiction about God torturing people that are dead? This is about somebody that might be dead in 12 hours. And you're walking by and going, be warmed and filled. Well, that's just ridiculous. That doesn't help anyone. And that's what the illustration is saying. Can your faith that God will provide, oh, just just name it and claim it and believe it, you'll be you'll be taken care of. No, how about you feed the person and give them some provision that warms them so they're not dead by morning? 
That's what it's saying. Your stupid depart in peace, be warmed and filled isn't doing anything. And that person is going to be dead in a few hours. So your belief in God's provision should work the other way around. Oh, you know what? I can spare the food I have and I can take this clothing off of my back because God will provide for me. I'm not about to be dead by morning. So faith without works is dead and worthless and does nothing for anyone. So let's again assume that this is a real world situation and you actually come across someone and you just think, well, God will provide what they need. Let's assume that God has provided you with what you need your faith in God's provision ought to take that away from you and give it to that other person because they're going to be dead by morning. Your faith isn't going to save them. Your provision is going to save them because they may have been sitting there for 38 years waiting for somebody to be bothered to say, is there something I can do for you? This is what it's really talking about in James chapter 2, but you have to get this stupid idea that it's talking about how God treats you when you're dead out of your mind before you can even get it right, because otherwise you're going to subscribe to this idea where the verse break is the end of the thought, and can faith save him? Oh no, the answer is no. Your faith can't save you. You're going to go and suffer eternal conscious torment after you die because you didn't help people or whatever like the illustration is just an illustration of works of kindness and it's not an illustration of what it means to save somebody because it's asking is, be, is, is walking by and saying God bless you be warmed and fed God provides God loves you and they've spent 38 years going I have no reason to believe there's a God and nobody has ever done anything for me, and I'm going to be dead by morning. 